we're in the last um, the last days, if you will, the last couple weeks left in this series, this summer series, King of Kings, um, Jesus according to Matthew. And uh, we've covered a lot of material in the book of Matthew leading up to today. We're going to be in the 26th chapter, and it's actually the, um, the last weekend, if you will, of Jesus' life. And you know, reflect over when I reflect over the series, we we talked about Matthew being a Jew by nationality, um, but vo- vocationally he was a Roman tax collector, and which really kind of lends itself that he had a very checkered past, uh, a very checkered spiritual past, a very checkered religious past. Uh, he, when he when he chose to become a um, a tax collector, it wasn't just a vocational choice. He actually had to physically make the decision to walk away from his family walk away from um, the temple. Um, and so there's a lot goes on in Matthew's life. And yet still Matthew, even though maybe if you rank the disciples, um, would be the least, the least likely disciple based on his past. Jesus wasn't uh, interested as much in his past as what was going to be his future. And that although he doesn't get the press that Peter gets, that John gets, um, he is still one of the 12, one of the 120 that the church gets launched, that Jesus chooses Matthew to begin the launch of really, I mean, we're sitting here today because of that kind of, that kind of launch. It's very encouraging to me that, that Jesus changes past. He doesn't just look at them and evaluate, and evaluate us based on them. Amen? Okay, maybe, maybe that's just me. Maybe it's just my past that I needed him to, uh, to move past. Today, well, the whole series has been around, actually I think I summed up kind of the essence of it multiple weeks ago when I said that, there, that we, there's a kingdom, whenever there's a kingdom convergence, his kingdom and this kingdom, it's going to present a kingdom clash. There's always going to be a clash. And that kingdom clash always produces kingdom choice. And so when we learn about God's kingdom, it opens our eyes to this kingdom and it opens our eyes to the continual clash. Um, John the Baptist, when he came, his, his message was this, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus comes up out of the baptismal water, he begins his ministry with the message, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. I don't think we understand repentance very well in our culture. Repentance isn't really an apology. Repentance is a change of heart, change of mind, change of direction. It is a it is a recognition of this way was only bringing me death, and I want to walk towards life. So repentance is this, this change and move away. And then the rest of our lives um, becomes, um, there's, a, there's a word that's called sanctification. It's a, it's a word you read in Scripture that about, you read the word sanctify. It's to be set apart, to be made holy. Sanctification then becomes this process Um, of how we become more and more and we look more and more like Christ, shaped by the Holy Spirit in His image. But I made up a word this week for this message, and I called it sanctification. And um, no one at the 9 o'clock service liked it either, so um, you're you're in good company. But it's my word, and I'm going to choose to use it. Um, It is the process of getting into rhythm with the kingdom. You know, um, Faye Foster, who... Uh, member in church. She's been in the hospital. She she got real serious at one time. Her heart went into AFib, but she was in the hospital. They were to to get her heart back in rhythm, and she's home now, and when I went to see her, she was up and eating, so I told her I would use her as an example today since she was feeling better. You know, this idea that when hearts get out of rhythm, trouble happens, right? And so so how do we sync? How do we sync? How do we get back in rhythm? How do we stay in rhythm, Um, especially in the hardest of circumstances, the hardest of circumstances, how do we stay in sync with this kingdom? Um, this may be uh, anytime God calls you to do something, there's always going to be opposition. Anytime we're going to kind of do what God wants us to do, become who God wants us to become, there's always going to be this wrestle. Wrestling, Don knows this, boxing is, boxing is more art Wrestling is an intimate form of combat because you are face-to-face, you are arm-in-arm. I mean, it is, it is a very emotional, very intimate, very physical kind 
of warfare. And yet that is the word so often used in Scripture of what we are. We're in a wrestling match with this kingdom. That this kingdom is relentless to get us to fade and to fail. Relentless. So the only, only way we can overcome that relentless pursuit of this kingdom is a relentless pursuit of his kingdom. Today, we get into the night that Jesus was betrayed. And I told you that the, the thing I love about Jesus' leadership is that Jesus doesn't point. Jesus leads. He didn't say, when he called the disciples, he didn't say, I need you to go that way. What he said was, follow me. All right? And so what we learn in a very intimate time, of, uh, it's really it's an amazing window that the Spirit opens up to us in the humanity and the divinity of Christ in today's passage. It really, I think, gives us a pattern by which how we sink our heart with God in the most difficult of circumstances, in the most difficult of times. You find the passage in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, Jesus has just spent this night of Passover together with his disciples. He had, he's reinvented, if you will, and magnified the importance of this sacrament, or it makes it into a sacrament. Um, there has been an amazing amount of download of teaching that's taken place. We find that in John, more specifically, John 14, 15, 16, 17. And now they've left, they've sung their hymn, they've gone to the Mount of Olives to pray. And this is really what it gives to me. It gives me this insight into the emotion of Jesus and his Father and the connection that they have together. And it's to me in, the, in this short passage that gives us kind of the, this window, but also this path to follow in our connection and our intimacy with, with God. And how that connection then can help shape some of the most difficult circumstances we could ever walk through. All right? So here it is, Matthew 26, 36 through 45. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time, and he prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayers. This is a unique pattern that Jesus is kind of seeing to us. And he's last days still kind of teaching what it means to have a connection with the Father, how to face some of the most difficult times in our life, how to sync our will with the Father's will. It's, it's really captured in the essence of verse 41. Verse 41 says, watch and pray. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. There's this acknowledgement of wanting to link my heart and my hands and my head with the Father's heart hands. But there is going to be temptation to not. Our flesh is weak, every single one of us. No matter how much we might want to do something, there is still something that works, a weakness that works against that, and that's what he's drawing our attention to. These might not be completely accurate, but this is kind of why I've seen this passage, that I've seen three different, what I've called, give-in temptations. Give-in to temptations when I hit those times. The first is a give-in to fear, that I'm afraid to do what God is directing me to. To do. I'm afraid to walk in the direction 
make the decision he's calling me to make. The second is a give in to weakness. But I see what God's wanting or desiring, and I'm, I measure that up against what I think I have left in the tank, and, and, and there's not enough in the tank if you're with me. And so the temptation is just to give in to that weakness. And the third is to, to give in to uncertainty. That I really can't figure out what God wants me to do. I, I feel I'm kind of lost in between the two kingdoms, and, I, and I'm not sure what to do or how to do it, and I kind of get, can give in to that uncertainty and not really do anything. The first thing he tells us to do is watch. I'm going to spend the majority of the time on pray, but I want you to hear a little bit about watch. He tells them to watch and pray. In contact sports, there's a phrase that's called, that says, keep your head on a swivel. Keep your head on a swivel. And because it, be, it means that dangerous can come from any particular direction. You're looking this way, you can get blindsided. So it says, keep your head on a swivel. See, Peter says it this way. He says that we are to be, to be sober, to be vigilant, to be watchful. He says because that we have an enemy that is roaring, a roaring lion that roams about seeking who he may devour. It's saying, be vigilant, be watchful, keep your head on on a swivel. These temptations should not catch us off guard. Now they do, but I think the key is how long do they keep you off guard? See, once, and this is just my personality makeup, once I realize that someone is trying to take advantage of me, I move away from the uncertain little I don't know what to do to, oh, now you've picked the wrong fight. Now, you might bloody my nose, but we're going we're gonna to tussle a little bit. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to wrestle. And so I really think that if we, can, if we can really find ourselves in the posture that if you are his child in this kingdom, we have to be watchful for these kind of temptations. To give in to fear, give in to weakness, give in to uncertainty. But when we can recognize where those come from and then we get ready for the fight, well, then Jesus tells us and actually demonstrates to us very, very plainly in this passage of how he fights and how he fights with, with prayer. The first given temptation, the one of fear. Listen to what he says in verse 37. He took Peter and, his two, and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said that my soul is overwhelmed. Pastor, are you telling me that the Son of God was fearful? I don't know if that's the right word. His words were sorrowful, overwhelmed. This is, this is not, this is fully God. God didn't, he didn't, Jesus didn't keep flipping a switch between his humanity and his deity. These things existed together. And if you can explain it, then you're, you're smarter than anybody in the known world. Yet he empties himself of his divinity. And so I would say he empties himself his ability to know all things, be everywhere, and be all-powerful. There was an emptying of the self, Scripture says, and we find him in, in, in the full-blown weakness of his flesh, that he's facing something that is going to demand more of him than what right now he's a, he has in the tank. Sorrowful, fearful, overwhelmed. Have you found yourself... In that place. And so he, he wants them to stay close to him. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. There will always be some element of fear when God is calling you out somewhere deeper. Or when you find yourself in a situation that is completely surrounding you. In both those circumstances, we have to understand going where God's calling us to go, to become who God's calling us to be, to do what God's calling us to do, to stand up underneath whatever is around us, all those things can only be done in prayer to the Father. He brought the disciples with him, but it's very interesting. I think this may be the only time in Scripture where we get this kind of insight into Jesus praying. Plenty of other times we have Jesus that said he went alone by himself to pray. You read that plenty of times in the Gospels. In this case, he goes, he goes away with his disciples, and then he goes by himself to pray. And so if you find yourself facing fear, here is the temptation buster, the way I worded it, is voice your fear in prayer, 
And God will provide follow-through faith. Stuffing your fear, masking your fear, trying to act like you're not afraid will not bring about the the strengthening resolution that you need, this tenacity to keep walking through. I know that in our culture, we see prayer as a passive response. And I'm telling you, prayer is not a passive response. Prayer is an invitation to the Father into our circumstance. It is, it, is a, it is an asking for partnership. That's why prayer is, should never be the last thing we do. It should be the first thing. In many cases, maybe the only thing that we do. Here's temptation number two, to give into weakness. To give into weakness. Luke's account of this scene is shorter than Matthew's. Um, but it records something after this first prayer that none of the other Gospels record. Here it is in his account in verse 43 of that chapter. It says, An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. So if you say, well, I'm, I'm not sure, Charlie, that you can get that he's weak out of this passage. All I can say then is this. The angel did not come to give him a pep talk. It doesn't say that the angel came to give him a hug. It didn't say the angel came to reason with him. It didn't say the angel came to commiserate with him. It said that the angel came and strengthened him. So that is a pure indication that Jesus was feeling weakness in this moment. And the way that God responds, his father responds to the weakness that Jesus expresses to him is he brings him strength in his presence. Man, I'm telling you. That when we get the presence and get in the presence of God, that it is an amazing strength that can come to us. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, Paul kind of has a take on this. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. There was something that that physically and or emotionally was was bothering Paul to, to the extent that he even named it. He called it a thorn. Um, if you've ever gotten a thorn, trying to prune a rose bush or something, everything hurts, right? So it's not something to take lightly, and, and he didn't, but he says that Christ's response, God's response back to him said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So then Paul makes a conclusion. Therefore... I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I want you to notice the complexity of this passage. Paul doesn't want to be where he is. He doesn't want to deal with what he's dealing with. And he asks and pleads multiple times for it to be taken away. But God's response is, you think this is hindering you. You think this is the problem. You think this is why you're weak. But in fact, it is to point you to my strength. And if you'll buy this, if you'll link with me with this, you're actually going to find my strength in that weakness. So Paul, who knows how long it takes him to liberate it, but as he writes it, he's, he's, it was like, oh, that's, that's enough for me. Well, then, then I'm just going to bask in my weakness. Because if that's truly where your strength gets exhibited, I'll be weak all day long. We don't want to be weak. We don't want to be seen in the eyes of anybody as weak, or at least I don't. We do a lot of things that mask weakness. But isn't it fascinating that God's telling Paul and Jesus is experiencing when, in fact, they go ahead and demonstrate and show the weakness. This honesty of weakness before the Father. This is the most intimate look we get into Jesus in Scripture. In fact, I would say if we were trying to convince somebody maybe that Jesus was God, we might want to leave this piece out. So here's the temptation buster. Show your weakness in prayer, and God will strengthen you with his presence. Still love. Not a pep talk, and I'll take them. I don't always like pep talks. When I, you can ask my family when I'm 
struggling with something and they want to try to encourage me. I'm not the easy, most easily encourageable person. I'll take the encouragement, but I'll take his presence. Here's the third temptation. Give in to uncertainty. Verse 40, 44 says, So he left them, he went away once more, and he prayed the third time. How many times? Okay, I'll try to finish early for you guys. It's, you're, not, you're not with me. Then he returned to the disciples, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer, uncertainty. And we don't know what to do, how to do it, when we should do it, how to do it. It it can be a very freezing kind of place to live. Have you ever tried to avoid hitting a squirrel? Boy, it is is not easy not hitting a squirrel, right? I mean, they... They're all over the place. You, 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 they're left and then right, and they can't make up their mind. And sometimes you just decide, I'm going to go right at them because they'll move. And then there's an inevitable, an inevitable thump under your car. You know, you just, it's hard to avoid a squirrel because they can't make up their mind. And we hear the scripture, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I can't make up my mind here or make up my mind here. And, and you say, well, again, pastor, are you saying that, that Jesus is uncertain? I don't know if that's the right way to look at it. I can say this is his third time praying the same prayer. G got his father hears him all three times. At least in our recorded version, those prayers aren't framed a whole lot differently. I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to conform to your will. But if you can find another path, I'm ready to take it. He gets the answer the first time, or maybe it's silence. We don't know, but three different times he has to go back towards his father. So when I look at this, I go, well, is this, the, is this the kind of the magic formula that all we have to do is pray three times, and after the third time, we get the answer? And I would say this. I would say this, this is where one of the old church phrases that my mom and grandmother would have used comes into play. Jesus prayed through. So what does that mean, Pastor? It means that I pray until I do, until I do get certain. See, we get frustrated at God sometimes. Well, I already asked God and He didn't say anything, so I'm just going to do what I want to do. Or I asked God I haven't heard anything, so I don't know what to do. What, 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 about, what about a tenacity in our prayer? What about hanging in there until there is some clarity? Or how about hanging in there until there's enough power to walk it out? Because here's, here's what I like. John records something that the other gospel writers do not record after this third prayer. All right? And so it's John 18. So I don't know how long this took place. It took enough place for the disciples to fall asleep, for Jesus to wake them up a couple times and then still be asleep. I don't know the duration of this. But here's what we find after he concludes the third prayer. This is how John records it. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who portrayed him, knew the place where Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. So they don't know who the dude is. I am he, Jesus said. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Temptation buster number three is to stay on your knees until you're ready to get up on your feet. That might not be the most poetic thing I've ever wrote, but it's pretty powerful. This is a great insight John gives us. Jesus Jesus is by himself in prayer, 
And he goes to the Father three different times because of this path that's in front of him. But when he gets up that third time, and this detachment of people come to him, he goes to them. Isn't that amazing? Well, Ian, who are you looking for? I'm looking for Charlie. Yeah? Yeah? Well, that's me. And Ian keeps backing up. No, 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 son. Who are you looking for? I mean, that's kind of what I picture. You came after me, so get up off your keister and come. I'm ready to go. I mean, that's the kind of strength that happens when we pray through. It's not just getting a definitive answer from God. It's, it's, it's getting the power of His Spirit to walk out what He's put in front of us to walk out. How do you sink your heart, hand, and head with the kingdom in the most difficult of times or the most difficult of asks? One, we got to be watchful that there are going to be specific temptations that will continually come. You're going to be afraid. You're going to be weak. You're going to be insecure. You're going to be uncertain. But these are not to catch us off guard. We keep our head on a swivel. We recognize not just that they've come, but who they've come from. And we know where they've come from, then we know the intent of the person that's brought them to stop us. Well, you ain't stopping me. I've been encouraged by the Father. I've been strengthened by His presence. And I'm going to walk forward. It's significant of the insight we gain from this passage of this moment of time in Jesus' life. But it's, it's not just kind of the words Jesus prayed. I wrote it this way. I said it, it's, it's as much about his posture as it is about his prose, about the words he uses. And when you think about it, he teaches the disciples how to pray in Matthew 6, part of this kingdom series. I preached, I don't know if I, I don't think I preached from, from chapter 6. But when he's teaching us how to pray, he's contrasting what he's teaching to how the Pharisees are praying. Okay? And so he teaches our Father, who art in heaven, how would be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. He walks through. We treat it like a formula. He's walking us through a relationship. He's walking us through how to sink our head, heart, and hands with his and his will. But when he contrasts it, he says, don't pray like the pagans that think that it's all about the words they are saying, the, the, the babblings. They go on and on, and it's not about that. I'm not saying prayer is not about the words we use, but it is as much about our posture. And one of the first things we read about in this, in Jesus' posture, is it is deeply, deeply personal. He says, my Father, my, not the Father and your Father, not even our Father. He's saying, my Father. It is deeply personal. When I have an ask or request, the manner in which I ask it and request it is probably pretty doggone dependent on the relationship that you and I have. If you're a stranger, the request comes going to come off differently. If, if you're a friend, it's going to come off differently. If you're a family member, it's going to come off differently. The deeply personal relationship that's available to us to God through Christ allows us to come to Him in a deeply personal manner. Deeply personal. Then it was specifically directed. Specifically directed. So, when He's teaching us all how to pray, and He uses our Father, the Greek for father there is um, a tender term, Abba, Papa, Daddy. In this case, he does not use the term Abba when he says my father. He uses a Greek word called patar. Or patar. And, it, and it means provider and protector. I think that's pretty significant. Again, because he didn't need a hug. He needed protection. He needed provision. He needed the strength of the Father. When I was in college, I was 800 miles away from home. I was homesick, only child, mama's boy. Homesick. Uh, no car my first year. Had the payphone down the end of the hall. Stacking the dimes, quarters up top of the payphone to call home. When I was homesick, called mom. Mom was going to be homesick with me. I wasn't going to call dad. 
that dad didn't have a whole lot of heart for the homesick thing. The next year, when I got my first speeding ticket, called dad. 609-758-3875 was our home number, and 8315 was the station number where my dad was. I knew he was at that desk. I knew he was going to pick up that black phone, and I knew he was going to chastise me a little bit and then laugh with me a little bit and tell me he would find a way to get me the money without mom knowing. It was specifically directed. He knew who he was going to. It was a personal relationship, and he knew he was going to. And guys, listen, it's the same way with us. There's a personal relationship made available to God through Christ. It's the sufficient thing we sang about today. The writer of Hebrews says that because of this sacrifice of Christ, that we can come boldly into his throne room and receive grace. You don't go to a king unless there's an invitation. So it was, it was very personal. Not a note about the, pers- the, the personal nature of Jesus' prayers. Have you ever been overwhelmed at such a level or at a loss for words at such a level that you actually were at a loss for words? You didn't know what to say, how to say it. You said everything that could be said. I mean, Jesus prays the same thing three times. You'd think he'd have some variation of the prayer. But it's not. It's just He's just gutturally honest with, with his Father. Paul tells us in Romans that in those moments that the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf, He intercedes on our behalf. He even phrases it this way, that with with groanings that can't be uttered, it's on the screen, Romans 8, prays on our behalf. Isn't that that the most unique thing, that that we actually have part of the Godhead that can pray for us even when we don't know how to pray? It's deeply personal. It's specifically directed, and it's really, really raw. I mean, it's really raw. It's not a metaphor when the scripture says that he sweated great drops of blood. It's actually, there's actually a medical term for it. Um, Hematohydrosis, hematohydrosis, where the, the, the capillaries that, that, re, that take blood to the, the sweat glands, they burst. And so the perspiration is filled with blood and perspiration that, that's caused by the, the overwhelming pressure of the moment. It gives it, this gives us an idea of how overwhelmingly pressured Jesus was. He didn't try to hide any emotion from God. Don't, you don't have to hide your emotion from God. You might have to hide it from other people, but you don't have to hide it from God. The last part of his posture that I've pulled out was that his prayer was intentionally independent, but it was not in isolation. What do you mean, Pastor? Again, all the other times I read in Scripture, he goes away, pray by himself, and then he comes back by himself. In this case, he brings the 12 with him. and he, Now, he leaves, or the 11 with him. He leaves eight here, and he goes a little further, and he leaves three other ones here, but he goes all the way over here to pray. There was, there was a need for him to be by himself, but he didn't want to be by himself. In my experience in pastoring, what I find when people are under heavy, heavy pressure, one of the temptations of the enemy is to isolate yourself away from the body. Happens for a variety of reasons. In this, the most stressful time of Jesus' life, if the team will come back up, he doesn't want to be by himself, but he has to be by himself. It's interesting, he comes back, he, when he comes back to the three and they're sleeping, he doesn't say, y'all just need to just, just leave. I should have picked a different three. I should have picked a different 11. He doesn't do that. He also doesn't say, well, I'm, I'm going to go find me a new garden. There are a lot of times people don't have the capacity 
sometimes to walk with you through the hardest of things. Um, when I even coach people that are friends with people, they'll say, Pastor, I don't know what to say. They're going through this or doing that. And, and I say, look, it's, it's more about presence than it is about your words. Because, again, when we don't know, especially guys, you know, I've, I've, I've just met so many men who, like, they won't go to a funeral or they won't go to a hospital or they won't, and I just, sometimes I just cringe inside. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to offend you. I'm not trying to offend you. What, I, what I'm trying to say is, listen, your presence matters more than anything you're going to ever offer by words. People need us to man up, to woman up, to be willing to stand if that's all I can do. Cry, if that's all I can do. Pray, if that's all I can do. We're all going to need, we're all going to need our independent times. But we don't need to be isolated. So what I want to do this morning is I want to give us an opportunity to respond to what Jesus gave us a window into. You might, be, you might be wrestling with the decision or you might be wrestling with how to sink what you believe God's wanting you to do or become. You're needing to kind of get your heart back in rhythm and sink that, and I want to give you an opportunity to pray. You may be walking through one of the most stressful most duress-filled parts of your life and you need to pray. And here's what I want to do. This might seem odd. But over here on this side, if you want to pray independently but not in isolation, meaning that no one, I'm not going to tell you you can't come pray for them, but I am going to say, I want to, I want to try to say that here, if you want to come pray by yourself, you need a moment in this setting, in the body, but you just, you just need to pray by yourself. In a moment, I want you to come over here and pray. Over here, you don't just want to pray. You want someone to pray with you. Someone to place a hand on your shoulder. Maybe someone asks you, how can I link my prayers with yours? I want you to come to this side. Okay? So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna conclude the worship service in a response and worship to a, to a song. If you do not have the need to pray, I invite you to worship. If you want to pray with someone over here, I invite you to come pray. So, Father, as, as honestly as we can today, Lord, I just, I just know and I believe that there are people watching online today, people who will watch this by archive, Lord, and people in the room right now, Lord, that there is this overwhelming, something overwhelming in their life, something maybe you're calling them to do or change, and there is a struggle. This morning, Father, we want to sync our life with yours. We want our heart back in rhythm. So, Lord, we come to you today in this moment believing in faith by what we've seen you lead us into, that you will meet us here with strength, with comfort, with direction, with hope. Thank you, Father, for meeting with us. If you'll stand as you begin to sing to my right, you want to pray independently but not in isolation. To my left, you want to come pray and you want someone to pray with you.
Watch and pray. Head on the swivel. Knees on the ground. I think posture matters. I know relationship matters. My prayer today, this week leading into today, is you'd find strength at the feet of Jesus. And if you haven't found enough yet, keep going back. Keep going back until you can get up. Amen. If you're a guest with us today, it's been great having you part of our worship service. Pastor Craig, others of us would love to get a chance to meet you right outside these double doors under the big C. We have a gift for you. We'd love to give that to you as well. Our benediction, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. You're rising up, you're laying down, you're going out, you're coming in, both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.